I would, just, I would like to say a few words about brain bases of language. We know from patients, from neurological studies, that some parts of the brain are particularly important for language. Actually, the, the whole brain, the whole uh, new part of the brain, the, the, the neocortex, which is especially large in humans, is important for language. However, there are specific parts of that big structure, the, 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 the neocortex, which are of particular relevance for language. And one of them is in the frontal cortex. Another one, a second one, is in the temporal uh, cortex, so behind the left ear. It's usually the left hemisphere, which is most important for language, in most of us at least. And uh, we know from case descriptions, neurologists in the 19th century already described uh, diseases that uh, involved the frontal language center, uh, which, uh, which were accompanied by problem in speaking and also some difficulty understanding. And then the, 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 the other one behind the ear, the temporal lobe lesion, also produced a problem in speaking and understanding. And, uh, and those uh, diseases uh, were called then aphasias, aphasias, language disorders after acquired brain injury in adults. So from, from, these, from these patients we know which parts of the brain have the, take the heaviest, the, the, uh, the, the, the most uh, burden, in, uh, mo or take most of the burden in language processing, so to speak. Now, why is that? We have models today that, uh, that would actually account for that, in, uh, uh, at least in part. We know that our brain has certain neuroanatomical structure. We know that our articulators, the mouth, are, are controlled by a region, the so-called motor cortex, articulatory motor cortex, which is very close to this, to, to this frontal language region. And we know that the, that the cables from our ears that tell the brain about acoustic signals we process, they reach uh, areas in the temporal cortex which are very close to those regions that would, uh, that would also be of particular relevance for language. So why then would these language regions uh, 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 take their home close to these inputs and outputs of language? Well, the explanation is, uh, can be provided by neurobiological models where we, where we put in, uh, where we uh, produce neural networks, so artificial brain-like structures where we, uh, where we have a motor cortex and then this frontal language uh, region and the, and the auditory cortex, the sound processing areas and also the uh, areas around those. And then we present this network with information uh, we, would, uh, we would actually p uh, produce and uh, receive during language acquisition, during early stages of language learning. If I play a baby or an early language learner, I may first say syllables like sil sil senseless syllables such as ba ba ba, or later on single words like bat or car. And those, uh, and, and those would of course be require, in order to move my mouth, would require that some, that, that some motor activation takes place and also at the same time there's activation in the auditory system because I hear myself speaking and therefore we have at two very distant uh, ends of the brain, if you wish, in the motor cortex, in the, in the, in the auditory cortex, in the front, in the back, we have correlated activation. And now I mentioned, I mentioned the term of correlation, and correlation is something, uh, correlation is something very important because our brain is particularly good at mapping correlations. It has learning rules that drive the strength between nerve cells according to the correlation of their firing. So if we have this correlation at different ends of our brain, when we speak, there, is, there will be strengthening 
of the links between these, uh, between these nerve cells. And because there are actually no strong connections between the motor cortex and the auditory cortex proper, the activation needs to take detours around, uh, take regions in other parts of the frontal cortex, close by parts of the temporal cortex, and those now happen to be linked with each other. And that's a particular important, particularly important feature of the human brain, because only very recently it has been uh, discovered that, especially in the left hemisphere, there are fundamentally strong connections between the, be, between this frontal uh, language area and this temporal language area that, uh, that that lead information back and forth between the two. So for mapping the correlation between motor and auditory uh, uh, neural activation, our, uh, our brain, our human brain, is especially good, well-developed, cut out for, if you wish. So, so the, the idea here uh, I, I'm trying to uh, bring forward here is that during, during our early language acquisition, when learning the first words, we would build neuronal assemblies, circuits of strongly connected nerve cells, one for every word and maybe larger construction, and, uh, and, and thereby we, uh, we built a vocabulary of words and longer, and, and longer junks of language, which then become, uh, become uh, um, consolidated over time and, and, and form the building blocks of language. And now back to our aphasia data, our, our brain lesion data. Now we can use this type of model and, uh, and, and, and lesion it in the front and lesion it in the back and then find that our artificial neural networks do something very similar to what patients with the frontal and the temporal uh, lesion uh, do what, what, or what they, uh, the, they show deficits as our, as our patients do. They have problems mainly in speaking when we lesion in the front, but there's also a detectable uh, problem in understanding language and even single words if the lesion is in the front. But, uh, and of course, if, if, if the back part, the temporal cortex gets, uh, receives a lesion, there's a heavy language understanding problem. Uh, but also some difficulty finding the right words and uh, composing the words in the correct way from their individual language sounds, phonemes. So we're, uh, we're here in the process of slowly but steadily improving our understanding of uh, brain language relationships. I have now only talked about words and this is of course very, uh, very simple topic relative to, to the uh, complex syntax and then the, uh, the meaning of words and, uh, and, and larger constructions and finally the, uh, the, the whole the social interactions in which language plays a big role but however these biological mechanisms kick in already very early and at a, at a very basic level and at this higher level, more complex levels, we have similar situations. So, so the language machinery can slowly but steadily be explained a little better now using neurocomputational work and of course looking at the patients in, the, in much detail and, uh, and, and of course a topic uh, which we could uh, elaborate on too um, with, uh, when we use neuroimaging and, uh, and, and modern techniques to stimulate parts of the brain. So one possibility is to look at patients with language disturbances and describe their problems. They may have problems naming objects, say this is a glass, uh, or um, or they may have understanding problems. So if you if you show them the glass and, uh, and 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 maybe a hand, and you ask which is the hand, they may point at the wrong uh, and at the wrong object. So these patient studies um, are one important part. Uh, then we do neuroimaging. We use fMRI, EEG, MEG, magnetoencephalography and look at the brain activation patterns elicited by speech sounds, by words, by little uh, 
constructions, by complex sentences or by whole interactions between communication partners. When I ask somebody to, to give me something and, and, uh, and, and, and he or she responds, there, there are specific brain activation patterns we can map. Uh, and a different uh, strategy is, of course, to, do, uh, to, to, to play patients with healthy people. There are methods to slightly affect the functionality of the brain by magnetic stimulation. So, and, and by that we can produce mini lesions or mini activations very focally, uh, much more focal than the usually big brain lesions. And then we can address the question, is a smaller part of the brain causally involved in, uh, in uh, language understanding, just to take one example. In 2015, we published a paper where we showed that stimulating the motor cortex in the frontal lobe uh, influences the understanding of single words. So some colleagues believe that the frontal cortex and especially the motor system is not so important for understanding. Certainly it's not so important as other parts of the brain, as the, 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 the temporal language region. However, it also plays a role in understanding and even at the single word level. We, we now know a little bit more, just a little bit more, about brain language relationships and we can even address the question why the language regions are placed in the brain where they are and uh, and we can use neural network simulations mimicking the brain, artificial brain, so to speak, uh, to provide explanations why certain aphasias, language disturbances, occur after specific lesions.